Hello, good day, and welcome back to Go on the Run. And today, oh, apologies for being so late on the videos. <laughs> Again, um, work has been sort of a little bit crazy for the past couple of weeks, um, but oh well, such is life. Thanks for your patience. Glad you're here, and thanks for sticking with me and um, being patient. Um, so let's continue from where we left off in Program Structures Part Two, and um, in that video. Um, so let me do a minus R, and so we're gonna do part two, and we're gonna make it part three, and so let's just go into part three, and um, we'll start up our visual code, code editor, and we'll see where we left off. Um, so in the last video, what I was showing you is that in main, we could handle error for each one of our function call, and this could you imagine at all we have a complicated initialization and other things that we're doing you know i'm just showing two here and you know this could kind of go on where we're testing everything and other stuff. we still have to do that if something is returning an error if we care about it we should definitely check it and make sure we're handling that and so if you're not going to check an error for something that returns an error you should make it clear with comments why you don't think it's important or why you're not checking it so that somebody else who has to maintain your code know why remember in software engineering we do not optimize for number of lines of code. Um, I don't remember who said it, but someone said, um, and someone who's really good in software engineering, um, that if you can write one line, you probably should write three, which means that, um, you know, if you think about functional program, people tend to try and optimize for lines for some crazy reason. Almost like if we don't have memory in our computer, almost like if we get in charge for the number of the fewer lines of code that we have. And so they try to do like five things on one line. That does, that reduces clarity. Now we can have a different discussion um, and I can talk to you about why I think that's sort of bad. But I think in the long run, what you want to do is your program to be clear. And if it, you have to write it on four or five lines, please do that and do not worry about trying to pack too many things on line. Some people complain about go having, you know, every function call and then you have to test it we're not optimizing for fewer lines. So if you have to test it, test it. It's clear that how oh, you call this thing, it returns an error, you're checking it. So we're still gonna do that. But what I'm saying is that I've noticed a pattern in the Go community. And this is guy who gave a talk, um, I wanted to go for con um, meetup one time. I'll, if I find a video, I'll definitely put it in the description below where he talks about um, how he uses this pattern I'm gonna show you, which is using a run function. So um, let's just start there. So I left you here essentially, and I showed that, you know, yes, we can, our features now um, sort of randomly return a, an error message depending on some silly tests. And assuming this number is random, then the error message when we get a message should be also be random. And we see that, so that's fine. And I updated all the features functions to do this. And then um, within the video I did, application one, but I didn't do application two. So um, if you didn't do application two yet, definitely um, make sure to you update application two to run this way. Um, it will still run because they were ignoring the return value, but we call feature A and then we call feature C in this case. So there we go. All right. And so, um, oh, I think I have one extra curly brace here. Okay. So everything is fine and it looks like we don't have any error messages. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a um, rename our function main here to just call it run. And then of course, if we're going to call run to do all the work that main usually used to do, we also want run to be able to return an error. And of course, if there's no error, we're going to return nil. So this doesn't seem like a big change really, right? Um, I will go ahead and I will say, let's rename this the file from main to run okay now there's nothing wrong with us leaving this run function in this file but as you'll see there's something else that I want to show and so I'll put it in a separate file and so let's now recreate our main.go and this is in package main and of course we do function main and then now we have to call this run function okay and of course this still returns an error so if error you know then we do error not equals to nil, um, then log rust that theta. And so again, this just looks like if we just shifted our problem, just sort of bury it a little bit. But like I said, imagine that our main is a little bit more complicated 
and you crawl and run, then you do some other things. Maybe you have to log this error somewhere else. Maybe you have to send, um, you know, um, send it off to other places, whatever. Maybe you have to do some cleanup or whatever. You have to call some other thing to notify that since we failed to sort of get our stuff going, maybe we're gonna shut down, whatever. So you're doing a little bit more work in air and main, but that's okay because the core thing that this program is about is in run. And then all the other stuff around it that might need to do before it initialize or after it finished do this core work, um, depending on what it's doing, maybe that is also here. So, you know, you have some pre things, some stuff that come after, right? Um, at least main, if you're not new to this code base, you could kind of just say, oh, this program does some stuff, then it tries to set up its core thing. And if that fails, then it does some cleanup or notify some other applications and all this other stuff, and then it shuts down. And at least you feel like if you have a basic idea of what overall the structure of this application is without even knowing the details, right? And then when you want to dive in, you can set us a, okay, let me dive in to see what run does. No, this is what run does. Run is doing all this other extra stuff. And then now at least you, you're ready you're ready to sort of explore run because you sort of have an overall idea of main itself. And just imagine if run, all the stuff that run did was actually in main, as soon as you approach the program, you sort of overwhelm immediately. Like I said, it's a mental trick, but I really, really like it. And so this doesn't change anything. Our programs still run um, the exact same way. So I'm not going to waste time building it because I think you're convinced that though we haven't really changed code significantly. But there's another advantage that you get from this. You see, before when we get an error, we sort of did log failure, fatal, and we could have actually put like, you know, um, different things in there, like, you know, um, log fatal F or something and put some description. But what I really like about this is allow us to do something like this. It allows us to do saying something like return FMT at error F. And this is a relatively new feature in Go. I think, I don't remember which version of Go it showed up in. It's called a wrapping error, right? So you can wrap your errors and it allows you to unwrap errors. So I can say, oh, um, failed to initialize, um, you know, feature A, for example. And this is the error message. Now, normally you would see somebody probably do something like this, right? Um, v for a value. But if you do this, what you're doing is you're turning this into a string, um, the error into a string, and then just print it out. But you're not wrapping it. But this new feature I talk about is this percent %w, which wraps the error. Now, why it wraps the error? Because when we return this error, we have an error wrapping another error and the error package as a unwrap method so you can actually unwrap the errors and so that's really nice because now not only do we re return the on the line error but we and we wrapped it with more description um, more information now if you come from something like java or something you've seen this with exceptions where it sort of prints out an exception stack now you don't want to get too crazy with this i like the idea that how you can wrap an error but I personally don't want to cross process boundaries and all that stuff with wrapped errors. Like um, if module A call module B call module C and stuff, um, at some point I want to get a sensible error message from the thing I call, and I don't need the very, very low level error message that it call. So you see this when you try to write a program that, or if you have a program that tried to create a file, and it can't create the file because the directory permission is wrong or whatever reason it can't do it or it tries to open a file and the file doesn't exist. You don't actually see the operating system error. You see an error message reflecting that program inability to perform whatever action you want. And the program, of course, got an, a low level error from the operating system, but it doesn't show you that exactly. Now, if you don't know C program and you never work with the libc library, this might not make any sense, but libc returns you know pretty much error code at number meaning something but no program really show you those error code they actually test the error code and say oh this is what it actually mean and give you a meaningful error and i think that's the right thing to do so on the one hand like i saying it's good to be able to wrap errors but don't take that too far where you have like wrapped error like a hundred level deep that that's just nuts you're passing up an error that most likely nobody's going to unwrap a hundred times and it doesn't really matter if they get to the very lowest error so use it with caution so anyway <laughs> um a lot of these things are guidelines um so you don't always apply them but you you know you, you have to sort of know when to use them they're, they're good things to start with 
Um, so we're doing OP, feature B. Enough talking. So I've quite kind of um, changed it and I've shown that, oh yes, I've sort of explained exactly what I'm doing when it failed, right? So you can imagine that each one is, I made them very simple, but you can imagine that, oh, I was doing something different and I kind of explain what I'm doing. And that's more meaningful to the user, right? And here, the advantage here and now in run function, we're not really dealing with the error in terms of what action we can take. We've left that up to main to figure out like this error is severe enough for us to fatal on or just log on continue, right? Um, and main can do that because it has the error and plus it can unwrap it to whatever level it wants. I don't show that here, but it could unwrap it and get to the actual error and decide, well, oh, this is not as serious as, you know, this, this can be worked around. I'll try something else. You could imagine run was trying to open a file and the file doesn't exist. Then we can say, well, that's not that serious because we can try a default file. So then we can recall run with some other file name and you know, things like that. So um, that is what this this uh, gives you, the ability to handle the error more elegantly. Plus that other benefit, like I mentioned about just making main as simple as possible. So two benefits there, but the key pattern here is being able to push out most of the hard work of main into a run function. All right, so that works. And, um, you know, you can totally go to the CMD and app one, for example, and then we go, build and you know we can run it of course and, and that's still run and we see our new error message here that filled in as right features that and it put the error message of course when it prints out a string it doesn't look like it's wrapped but you can trust me that it's unwrapped we haven't dealt with that yet but you can look it up um if you want to understand about unwrapping errors okay so this seems pretty silly um, that we just have this other function that we created and it's sitting right there in the command directory and we want the command directory to be simpler. So main itself is simpler, but the run function is right there. And so there's one other thing we can do and I'm gonna leave fixing up um, app two, the same way we fixed app one for, as a to-do for you. But when I push the code, app two will be fixed, okay? Here's the next thing that I've seen and this is a feature of the Go compiler. Remember when we have things in these directory, they're packages, okay? So we have pack a feature in package A, we have a feature in package B, we have a feature in package C. And we can reuse those features or those packages in our application. But the other thing that happened, which we haven't done yet, is that some of us, when we push our code to a repository, someone else could import our features and they too can reuse them, okay? And we'll, I showed you in the presentation how you might want to hide certain features and all that stuff. So what if we put run in its own package so it can own, it can be used by app one, but we also don't want it to be used externally. And so for that reason, there's this ability to do something called an internal package. And so you can do internal, and we'll see that you could put internal at sort of every level, but we're gonna put it here at root for now, for this example. And we're gonna say, what we wanna put internally is the things that are in command and, um, we specifically want application, let's say application one, okay? And so um, with this in place now, what we can do is move run to this directory, okay? And if you go back here, you'll see that it says that oh, it can run is undeclared. It doesn't know where to find run, which, which sort of makes sense, even though, you know, run says it's package main, but this is not actually pa package main. This package is actually package A, app one, okay? And so, but isn't it's in a different package. We know that we couldn't access it because um, it was private. So we have to make it a public function. And then now we can go back here and call this function with capital R. And then if we save it, all right, uh, oh, we say app one that run. That's what we wanted to use. And now you can see that we pulled in our run function from package app one, and this is an internal package. Now, there are some other things where um, internal, well, I'll leave that off because it'll get pretty confusing without being able to show you an example. So we'll revisit using internal, I think, in the very next video. So what did we do? Let's recap. We have simplified main by putting all its work, essentially or most of its work in a run function. We move that run function to a package, 
but that package is internal. And the reason why we did that is we don't want someone else who have access to our repository to be able to create the exact same program just by simply cut or most of the program by simply call and run. So for whatever reason, we don't mind exposing some of the features, but supposing that run actually calls some other internal features, which we haven't discussed, discussed yet. We discussed, but we haven't shown how to do yet, but it's going to be along the same line. We don't want them to be able to call that. So, um, so that is one way in which we can hide um, things. So this package, this old command package and the sub package app one, they're all hidden and cannot be imported by someone who tried to use our repository because go tool and understand internal to means keep this hidden. And they can still use feature A, B, and C. Okay, so that gives us a hint as to how we can create hidden packages, um, but there's still more to internal. And so I'll leave that here. I think uh, this is nice and short and hopefully you appreciate how, you know, Go tooling just really allows you to structure your program. And in a way, I think it's sort of common sense um, structuring and it's nice to have that sort of built into the tool. Um, I really have to, you know, using Java and C and all these other things where you have to manage dependency and you have make files and stuff. And you can still use make and, and go and you'll see that too. But just managing dependencies and stuff and how that's or all that stuff is dealt with. I really appreciate the Go tooling for how it helps you as approach some of these things. And to Go's credit, it did this because they learn from all these other tools. Like if you have a you use in Maven and you have a POM file or even Gradle, the dependency is crazy. Whereas in Go, you simply have these one entry and it sort of look like how you might have in a Gradle file. But remember, we didn't have to put this in directly. Like we just sort of said, oh, we're going to use it. And then we said, pull it. And you know, it sort of updates and self manage Of course you can manage it yourself, but I don't want to lament too much on this and make this too long. Again, thanks for your time. Thanks for your patience. Uh, if you're enjoying the video and you're here, you've watched the entire video, please consider subscribing if you haven't subscribed. If you are subscribed, then hit that notification bell so you know when I do post videos. And if you're able to, you know, contribute in whatever way you can, either by, you know, thumbs up the video, just, just comment and help. Um, keep it on um, the top so the YouTube algorithm will show it to other people, help grow the channel. I would really appreciate that. So the minimum, please subscribe, click the notification bell and comment. And then if you want to go a little bit further, then look at how you can support if you can in these different ways that I have here. All right. Take care. Stay safe. Have a great rest of the day. Bye.